Okay. Boker Tov. Good morning to everybody. And we are continuing our Sunday morning coffee and learning. I'm glad you can join us today. Let me open the page over here. And um, so as we do every Sunday morning, studying some Torah here, first let me say a bracha, baruch, ata, adonai, yalaheinu melech olam, shahakol niya bidvaro. And we shall begin with... Um, uh, as, as the title of the classes, we're learning now between the Passover and Shavuos, you learn the, um, we learn ethics of the fathers, in preparing for the giving of the Torah, which happens on Shavuot. So we are going to be learning chapter 2 this week. This past Shabbat we learned chapter 2. So um, just to move around, not necessarily sticking to one subject, you know, to go around to different statements here on yeah, sorry, in chapter 2, things that we could share and learn from. So let's move forward. So the first Mishnah begins with Rebbe Oimer. Rebbe says, a Rebbe asks a question. What is a um, proper path for man to choose? And he says, Kol Whatever is uh, beautiful to the person that does it and is beautiful, but the Fetus Lemonodim is beautiful to mankind. That's what Rebbe says is the path for man to choose. I'm not going to elaborate on this statement, but I'm reading it in order here. Then he continues to say, You should be careful with a minor mitzvah, just like you are careful with a severe mitzvah or a major one. Now, what is a, considered a minor one, what's considered a major one, is up for discussion. But he gives a reason why you shouldn't differentiate between a minor and a major mitzvah. You do not know the reward for mitzvahs. And therefore, you don't know what's considered major or minor. And this reminds me of a very known story with, um, with the Radvaz, with Rabbi David ben Reb Shloime ibn Zimro. This is... Um, somewhere in the uh, 15th century or 16th century I think in the 15th century so the Radvah is talking about that we don't know the value of a mitzvah and which mitzvah and therefore don't weigh mitzvahs and don't measure mitzvahs mitzvahs as in good deeds as in godly deeds as in holy deeds so the general term for that is mitzvah although the literal term for mitzvah means uh, a commandment but um he says, don't measure mitzvahs because you don't know the value of mitzvahs. And there was the story of a fellow, uh, the Dradvaz was one of the leading halachic uh, Torah authorities of his day. And he was asked a question by someone who was imprisoned. He was sent a question in writing by someone who was imprisoned by the, uh, by the king. And the question the fellow asked was that he's being granted, this, was the, this is the following question, he was told, he, said, he asked the Advaz, he's being granted one day um, parole or freedom, and then he's being put back into prison. Okay, I guess there was some sort of system where they allowed that, uh, maybe for good behavior, I don't know exactly why. And he asked the Advaz the following question, he says, look, I'm being, I could choose which day I can uh, I can take off. It's up to me. So what day do I do so? What day do I ask for my freedom? Do I ask my uh, the day should it be Yom Kippur, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, so that I could fast properly? Should it be on Pesach, so that I could have matzah, eat matzah, which is a very important mitzvah, etc. You know what day should I choose? I'm not sure what's the day. From a Jewish Torah perspective, what day should I choose? And the Radva said to him the following. The Radva said to him, you should choose the first day that you can. Tomorrow. Because you do not know the value of mitzvahs. And the first day that you have an opportunity to be a free person and to do good, to do good deeds, to do, to do positive, that's the day that you should go ahead and you should, and you should uh, choose. Don't push it off. 
of course, there's other messages here. You don't know who knows, uh, you know, especially in today's in, in, in the environment that we're in today. You don't know how long you'll you'll still be around. But that wasn't his reasoning. His reasoning was, you don't know the value of mitzvahs. You have a mitzvah, you have an opportunity to do a mitzvah today. Don't push it off for tomorrow, even though tomorrow seems to be more important. Important message, important lesson. As we learn again, ethics of the fathers, which is about making us sort of feel better. Then he continues, as he tells us about uh, Pirkei Avot, he continues and says the following. He says, hefsed mitzvah Always measure the loss of the of doing a mitzvah as it is corresponding to its reward. And the same thing as charavera, this charav an avera of a, of some, a wrongdoing, keneged hefseda. And and it just you know it's just interesting. I mean, I was listening to um, I like to listen to Dennis Prager, and not so much for the political analysis that we get plenty of, but that he has he has some wise things to say. And the other day I was listening to him, and uh, so he said, so he spoke exactly about this. He says, you know, one of his, his um, and the truth is he's, he just articulated well, but this is what the mission is saying. You know, there's a debate going on. Let me back up for a second. There's a debate going on in this country. It's a very serious debate. Uh, there's a debate going on in this country of, of, um, of what is it that uh, we should be doing as a society in this country, in individual states, communities, globally? Should we be reopening? Should we be reopening society? And there's the pros and cons, you know. The and we all know this. We've heard this. We've heard this from the debate is a raging and it's a very serious debate. And there are good people on both sides of the debate whether we should remain in seclusion because every life, every individual life is worth all life. There's no, there's, no, there's no price tag that we can put on life. And therefore, if we reopen society and as a result we risk people losing their life, then, um, then so be it. We have to stay closed. Pikuach, in, in the words of the Chazal, in the words of our sages, Pikuach nefesh doche takol, the save, saving of life pushes off everything. And there is a strong voice, passionate voice for this, and absolutely. Then there's the other side. The other side is, the other side of the debate, again, as we've all heard is, you know, by staying closed, the livelihoods that we're ruining, and that takes a, 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 a price, that takes a toll on life. Um, how many people who are avoiding going to the hospital that maybe need to be diagnosed in terms of... Uh, of treatment that could perhaps save their life in the future and these are numbers and statistics that are very very hard to determine so there is a debate going on basically the question every single time in life when we take something it is similar to what and maybe we'll learn this Mishnah later the Mishnah says a little bit later and I'm jumping around and that's okay it's okay it's okay to be out of the box a little bit the Mishnah later says that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai had five students and he asked each one to say something. He asked them to say something about a good attribute uh, of how to live life. And Rab Shimon Omer, Rab Shimon says the following. This is later in this week's chapter. Rab Shimon says, and I hope my shaking doesn't get you dizzy, but that's how uh, that's a habit from the days in yeshiva. That was, I guess, the exercise that we got. Rab Shimon says that Ezo, that what's the best thing for a person's life, for a person, uh, what's the best attribute? way of life for a person to adopt is somebody who sees the future. In other words, a person who sees the consequences of their actions. Every single time you do something or you make a decision, you have to evaluate. You have to really understand what is the consequences to your actions. That's such an important thing in life. The way Rabbi Rabbi puts it over here is sort of in the positive. When a mitzvah comes up and you say, nah, I don't want to do it. It's too hard, it's too difficult, I'm lazy. It's the nature of a person. You have to go ahead and ask yourself, what is the loss of me not doing the mitzvah based on the reward that I will get for doing the mitzvah? The, the mitzvah, the good deed, the help that I'm helping someone else, the act of, the, the act of holiness to fill in, whatever it might be. The reward, which is an eternal reward, reward the impact that you the positive on someone else versus the momentary hesitation or lack of interest, desire, motivation, and so on. And the same thing the other way around, schara And the reward for doing something that you shouldn't be doing, keneged, 
the loss most of the not most the the loss is so so the loss of doing something that you shouldn't be doing is far greater than the momentary pleasure and and, and gratification that you have and that's what it's all all about it's always about measuring the human being as 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 he says later in this same chapter a person has a yetzer hara and has a yetzer tov. He has a good inclination and a negative inclination. A good and a yetzer bad, negative. I mean, let me back up for a second, Nick. Okay, I want to I want to share this following thought also that I heard from Rabbi from Rabbi Tversky. He was a great writer, speaker, and so on, and he should be well. I think he's he's he needs a refuah shleima himself. So may God send him a refuah shleima. But um, the the when when. When God, when the world is in the beginning of the parsha, in the beginning of the Torah, in the beginning of the Torah, when God creates man, and I'm not sure if I shared this in the past, but we'll share it again regardless. Hashem, in creating man, says, "Naase odom betzalmenu kibuseinu." Let us create man in our image. Now, what's peculiar over here, and Rashi points this out is that unlike any other aspect of creation in Genesis over there it says Vayomer Elikim and God said Yehi Or let there be light Vayhi Or and there was light Vayomer Elikim Tachyar it's Desha may the earth spring forth uh, vegetation and vegetation came forth only with man does it say Naase Odom let us make man so why over here does it say let us make man Seemingly, God should have also said, E'ese, or she just said, Vayomer Elikim, and God said, Yehi Odom, let there be man. What is this, Na'ase Odom, let us make man? Now, various answers. Rashi addresses this question. Commentaries address this question. There was misleading uh, interpretations of this, of this statement. Uh, Rashi says, Na'ase Odom, since man is so powerful, and the angels are jealous of man, which is a tremendous statement on the power and the greatness of man, that God, in order to make the angels reduce the jealousy of the angel, or remove the jealousy of the angels, said, Na'ase Adam, let us make man. But Rabbi Tversky gives the following insight, which is a, a beautiful insight, and it relates to our Mishnah that we're talking about, that you always have to measure the benefits, the consequences of your actions, especially when it comes to good and bad. Rabbi Tversky offers the following insight. He says, Na'ase Odom, let us make man. Who is God speaking to? He's speaking to man. He's telling man, let us make man. Thus meant us. What does that mean? The only creature, the only creation of all of God's beautiful Madrabu Masech HaShem, Magodlu Masech HaShem, how vast and how great is your work, O oh God, as, as the Psalms says. Only man is godlike in the following sense that God, that man has freedom of choice, has the, the ability to make moral decisions. Nothing else in creation, nobody else in creation can make moral decisions. They act on instinct. They act uh, on pre-programming, being pre-programmed, right? Um, but man has been given this amazing trust by God. Hashem, God could have created us just like angels. We're pre-programmed. But no, God gave us the choice to make the right, to make the choice to choose between good and bad. When man makes... so that uniquely man when God says Nasa Odom let me make man by the very definition he is saying he is saying that I can't make man you know why I can't make man because man by definition makes means making the right choices and only when you make the right choices are you being are you reaching your purpose of creation are you actually creating yourself fully Whole, you're being a whole, a full person. 
In other words, if you only do what your instinct tells you, what your craving tells you, you only give in to your cravings, self-gratification, then you're animal-like. You're no different than the animal. But Na'asa Adam, God says, I can't make man, because for man to be a man, it's when he has moral choices and he makes the right choice. Which is why you see that with a human being, any human being who only give, only follows and satisfies their gratifications, not to say that you can't have some pleasures in life, but if that's what all your life is, fulfillment of gratification, then you're not happy with yourself because you're not being a human being. You're not being a man. So God says, Na'asa Adam, only you and I, the person with God together, can create man. It's a beautiful insight. Think about it, you'll see it's a beautiful insight. So in this Mishnah, the Mishnah tells us that you should measure whatever you do, an Avera, a sin versus the consequences, and a mitzvah or the, or the leaving out of mitzvah versus the consequences. And then in that note, and this is also a little continuation to what we just said, Rebbe continues, His takel dvarim, you should look at three things. Three things you should always look at. And he gives us a number, even though we could count, you know, many things in Pirkei Avot are divided into three. So why does he give us an introduction? Look at the three things. Because in general life, you always have to think about three things. God Almighty, yourself, and your mission and purpose. It's always something you have to keep in mind. Or to say it in more sort of modern terms, what you are needed for. Not what you want, but what you're needed for. And if you look at, if these three things, histakel, by the way, it doesn't mean lirot. Histakel in Hebrew means to really look into. If you're always going to look into that there's three things you have to keep in mind, these three things, you're going to be a much more content, complete person as Rebbe's trying to make a, a, a person, is a derech yeshara, what's the proper way? And then he says, what are these three things? Da ma'la ma'la mimach. Always know what's above you. Which is what? What is the things that are above you? So he, he, he tells us what they are. He says like this, Da ma'la ma'la mach, know what's above you. Now again, this is an introduction to the next three statements. So what does it mean, Da ma'la ma'la mach, know what's above you? So the Maggid of Mizrich, the disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, the teacher of the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Hasidus Chabad, says a beautiful insight. He says, Da ma'la ma'la mach, know that which happens above, even in the heavenly, celestial, spiritual, godly worlds, mimach is dependent on you. Your actions are so important that what you do impacts God Almighty. Damalamailo, whatever happens above in the spiritual holy realms, Mimach is dependent on you. What you do or no, don't do is not insignificant. Today we know this even more with the coronavirus. One person, one person does something that is negative and it catches this virus and they can infect an entire world. And we have a klal, we have a rule in Talmud, Meruba Mida Toiva, that good is more powerful than negative. So what you do affects the entire universe, it affects what happens above, and if it's so in the negative, how much more so it's in the positive. Keep that in mind. And he says the following three things, I and Roya, you should know there's always an eye that sees. The Oiz and Shemas, there's an there's a ear that hears. All your deeds are recorded. Today's modern technology, it's not hard to understand that. And I want to say also that this was something that the Rebbe, our Holy Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, my saintly sort of teacher and mentor and so on, would, would, would quote this statement from the Mishnah with regards to how we educate our children. Our children school at home today we're all teachers many jokes about that how uh, how yeah how, how lots of things have changed in school but the, the the Rebbe would stress one very very key point that in educating our children we have to remember two things and one is more important than the other we have to remember that educating our children is about, you know, a, a child has sort of a body and a soul. When you educate our children, it's very, very important to remember that we have to 
place more emphasis not on what they learn in terms of academic knowledge, but how we develop their soul, their moral character. You know, when when you talk to your children, what do you what is what do they sense is more important to them? Do they sense what's more important to them is how they're going to earn a living, or do they sense that what's more important to you is what kind of person they're going to be? Are they going to be a good person or not a good person, or a, or a, or a bad person, or a, an evil person, or whatever? There's many many levels in between. What you should be stressing to your kinderlach first and foremost, and they should sense that what's more important to you is not so much what they will be. I'll make a living, of course that's important. But what's most important to you is who they're going to be. How are you developing their character, their soul, their neshama? So how do you develop a child's neshama? That he's, before do it or her, before she or he will do something wrong or want to be motivated to do something right, it's not dependent on the fact that there's a policeman that might catch them. But if they can get away with it, let's go ahead and do it. This is the one of the this is the most important foundation. I in the Roya, there's an I, there's a supreme being, there's a God Almighty who created us and is involved in our lives, and he watches and knows what's going on. The Oizen Shamas, and there's a hair that listens, and whatever you do is recorded. Not physical recording. It means whatever you do, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's a, the greatest compliment that Hashem, that God Almighty is giving us. It's the greatest compliment. You know, when you're sitting in a public place, you're sitting in, uh, in a mall, you're sitting in shul, you're sitting in uh, wherever it is, you're sitting in a synagogue, God willing, very soon, and all of a sudden there's a kid crying and making a, a ruckus and making a noise, and you turn around and it's not your kid. Ah, you, I'm a chaya, it's not my kid, I'm good. Because you don't really care. I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't, but that's the reality. It's not my kid, not my responsibility. But if it's your own child, then you care, right? What happens, what happens if you have your child and you let them do whatever they want? You know what? In the beginning they might be happy, I can do whatever I want. But eventually... They're going to say, my, my parent doesn't love my dad, my mom doesn't love me. It's a form of mental abuse. So, the Masech, God is telling us, I love you. It's important to me what you do. I'm watching you. Every single thing that you do or don't do is being recorded because you're my child. And that's the message that we must ingrain within our kinderlach. If we want them to be people that will grow up to be good people, whether they'll be a lawyer, a doctor, a mechanic, a plumber, it's all good as long as they make a living, an honest living, and they raise their kind, your, your grandkids, God willing, that's all good. That's not as important. What's important is who they will be. Okay, let's move on. I think the message is clear. Let's learn a little bit more, another Mishnah over here, or a little part of a Mishnah. And um, and also in line with the same, sort of with the same, uh, with the same schnitt, as we say in Yiddish, the same idea. Okay? This is in the middle of Mishnah, and this is uh, a Mishnah, the fourth Mishnah. Mishnah means the, sort of a paragraph within chapter 2 of Ethics of the Fathers. So the Mishnah says, Hu haya oimer, sorry, Hillel Oimer, Hillel, the famous Hillel. And by the way, talking about talking about the importance of who they will be, what's really important, Hillel sends that gives us that message. The Talmud has the following statement. The Talmud says that Hillel and Rabalezam ben Kharasum, I think it is, are the ones who are Mikhayev. I'll first say the the statement and then a translator or explain. Mikhayev Aniyim. Hillel mechayev aniyim and Reb Elazar ben Chasu mechayev ashirim. It means like this: that after when after 120, you come up and you face the Creator, the Day of Judgment, and the Heavenly Court starts to judge, and you say, you know what? I didn't have time for Torah study, the most important, best gift God gave us into enhancing our lives. I didn't have time. Why didn't you have time? I was too poor. I was too poor. I was so fayyukt. We say in Yiddish. Whereas Jackie Mason says, I was so far yuzhet, I was so far yucked that I didn't have the time to go ahead and 
and uh, make a make a living and, and and learn Torah because I was so busy making a living I just couldn't put food on the table I was so uh, distracted I was so I mean I get that all the time we all get that we understand it we all are a little guilty of that sometimes as well or he says I was too wealthy I was just I, I just had I had so many employees I had I was just too busy things were going on I couldn't not and this and that so I get Tell you, by the time we finish any of these classes, you'll always learn a little Yiddish as well. Give us a like for Yiddish if you like. If you like to learn a little Yiddish, so <clears throat> the Gemara, the Talmud says that Hillel and Rebbelezim and Charsum are Mechayev because Hillel was the mo- the poorest individual, and he would go out out every single day, and he would he would chop wood to try to make a living and half he would bring home for his family and half he would give to the synagogue where they had a very very tough membership uh, a watchman that if you didn't pay your daily fee they wouldn't let you in the synagogue and the Talmud relates I know some of you know the stories I'll make it very short that he climbed up onto the roof of the of the synagogue where there was like a there was like a um, what's the word I'm looking for you know where there's a where there was a skylight and he would put his ear to the to the to the glass so that he could hear his teachers teaching Torah. Meanwhile, a major storm broke out, and he was so engrossed in the learning he didn't even notice, and his body became covered in snow, and he almost froze to death until one of the teachers realized that there's a figure up there. They went and they revived him, and so on. So Hillel, totally, who was so poor that he had to he had to give up half his earning every single day but nevertheless had such a love for Torah. We're not getting into the discussion whether the synagogue was right for being so tough. I'm sure everybody here listening has, has an opinion on that. But regardless, that's what Hillel did. Rebbe and Kharsom, on the other hand, was so wealthy, he had ships and boats and whatever, but he only involved himself in study Torah, he hired managers, whatever it is. Okay, the point being is, if we want something, we can make time. On that note, let's get to this Mishnah. The Mishnah says here, this is from Hillel. First of all, the Mishnah says, Al tifrosh min hatzibur. Do not separate yourself from the community. And this is very apropos. I saw this, we've got to learn this today because we have limited time. I don't like to schlep this out too much, maybe another five, ten minutes. Because Sunday morning coffee is not about a five-minute Torah. It's about sitting and learning Torah. So I hope you have the patience and we learn. And nishka heiltzich, without a rush. Anyway, l'chaim over here. Um, <clears throat> you know, this past Parsha is all part of what we're talking about here, so stay with me. This past week's Parsha, um, I see over here, I just waved. I'm not going to say names, so not to embarrass somebody, but one of my Bar Mitzvah boys, I think from like 20 years ago, is listening over here. You know what kind of nachas I have? Talking about raising children. The Talmud says your students are your children. I see one of my Bar Mitzvah boys. Who is uh, from from who knows how many years ago? Who is listening to class over here? It's 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 a real nachas. It's a real satisfaction. May you be blessed. So <clears throat> Hillel says, "Al tifesh menatzibur." Do not separate say to yourself. Do not separate yourself from the community. Um, very apropos because now we're all uh, in quarantine. And this relates to the Parsha, this week, last, this past Shabbat, the Parsha of the Torah, the section of the Torah we read was about the leper. And we spoke about this in our pre-Shabbos Devar Torah. The leper who has to be in seclusion. Why does he have to be in seclusion? Because the leprosy is a spiritual punishment, the one the Torah is talking about, for causing strife by speaking Lashon Hara, by speaking negative talk. And by, and, and by doing so, you're dividing people. So the leper is put into seclusion so that he should realize the value of people being together, the value of people that he's separating one for another, realize how harmful a gossip and negative talk can be. So he has a week to be able to uh, um, meditate and, and, uh, and introspect on this, reflect on this, because when you're in seclusion, that's when, you know, whenever you have something right, it's like, it's like, I know with my enikach, my grandkids, when they're with you, you love them, you enjoy them, but you miss them when they go home. You say, where's, where's my grandkid, right? 
you know, when you don't have something, that's when you start to realize its value. So the point of the seclusion now that we're all experiencing is, amongst other things, obviously health and making sure that you don't harm someone, but on a spiritual level, it's also about evaluating and reevaluating all our relationships, the people we hung out and we hang out with, their value, not to take them for granted. What good quality do they have? How could I bring them something positive and good? Who are the people I shouldn't be hanging out with? Negative influence. So all that is why we're in seclusion right now, is, is to introspect and reflect. Now, having said that, having said that, um, the Mishnah, Hillel says like this, Al Tivish do not separate yourself from the community. And I'll, a, a community is very, very important to be part of. And I'll highlight this with the following story. There was a Jew who used to come to shul, used to come to synagogue regularly. And uh, then he stopped coming. He stopped coming. One day he shows up, and the rabbi says, you know, uh, Chaim Yankel, Moshe, uh, Joe, uh, Craig, whatever it is. He says, you know, we missed you. We haven't seen you in the synagogue. We haven't seen you. So there actually was the other way around. The rabbi actually went to visit him. The rabbi came to his house, went to visit him, and he said, you know, we miss you at, at the show. So um, the guy said to the rabbi, look, God is everywhere. God is in the synagogue. God is at home. I pray at home. I'm at home. I do my thing at home. So uh, the rabbi didn't respond in with words. What he did was he walked over to the fireplace. He took one of the coals and he put it out, he separated it from the rest of the whole pile of coals in front of the fireplace and he left. In the beginning he didn't understand, but then he realized that the fire was still burning and the coal was burning out and, and finished, gandict. So um, he realized the rabbi's message. When you're together, everybody keeps each other burning for longer. But when you're separate, then sooner or later your coal, your fire, burns out, becomes extinguished, becomes extinguished, sorry. So, do not separate yourself from the community because by being part of the community, you motivate each other, you look after each other, you help each other. And then there's another very beautiful insight into the word tzibur, you know, a Jewish community. A community could be referred to as a kohol, which means a kehila. Can be referred to as an Ada, can be referred to as a Tzibur. Tzibur, and they all mean, Tzibur literally means something that's grouped together. Lizbor, a group together for those who understand Hebrew. But Tzibur over here also has an acronym of Tzadikim, Beinanim, Rishoyim. Tzadikim means righteous people, Beinanim means regular, ordinary, where most, most of us are in that category. And Rishoyim means the wicked. And the commentaries tell us that a real community is one that has all three. One that has righteous people who are our leaders, who are our role models. And on that note, I mentioned that sadly and tragically in this whole corona, many of my childhood role models who were elderly have, been, have died, primarily in the Crown Heights community. Very sad, great people. And number two, you have to have Bainanim. Those are the middle, me, the regulars. They're the, they're the regulars who make things happen, I guess, to some extent. They're the bulk of the community. And then you also have to have a shame. You cannot reject the people who are not as good as you. It's, I get this often. Rabbi, how could you let this person in the, in the synagogue? They're doing this, they're doing that. They're not behaving properly. And, and, and you have to evaluate because sometimes someone could really be a bad a bad uh, presence in the shul for whatever reason. But by and large, as a community, a community is only whole when it has the entire group, the entire range, dynamic here of good people, not such good people, because it's, it's not just for us. We have to be there. But there's one ca caveat, as commentaries point out. Tzadikim come first. They, it has to be a community that values and recognizes that they're the leaders. If it would be the other way around, if it would be Rabats, that was the Rishayim, where the ones leading the community. The wicked are leading the community. And the Tzadikim are on the bottom? No. Tzadikim 
are on the top, we recognize their value, we recognize their strength, they have to be the leaders. And the Rishoyim are the minority. Because of the Rishoyim, if the wicked ones become the majority of the community, that's why they're last. Not last because they're less important. Because just like we said in the beginning of this chapter, we don't know how to measure importance. We don't know how to measure importance of any individual. But they have to be last in the sense that they're the minority in terms of influence. So Al Tifresh says Hillel, Al Tifresh Menatibur, do not separate yourself from the community. And by doing so, by learning about this, hopefully we could bring this about in reality that this will actually come to be, that we could again get together as a community, not just via technology, which is a wonderful thing and it's being used in a fantastic way, but in real life or in real uh, face-to-face -face because the chemistry of being together uh, is is far more enhanced when, it, when we could be together. Okay. I want to finish this Mishnah. With that, we con will conclude with today's class. Hillel says, the famous Hillel again, says, do not believe in yourself until the day of your death. How apropos, again, for the times that we live in when unfortunately there's so much death around. Do not believe, do not be overconfident. Life is a continuous struggle of good and bad and good habits, bad habits, and so on. Never take yourself for granted. Always work on self-improvement. The Rebbe once said to somebody who came to visit him, uh, and said, part of the sign of being alive is a living thing is always growing. So if you're a vegetable, you're growing by by growing in nutrients and uh, etc. If you're a human being, as we said earlier, Nasa Adam, you're always growing in self-improvement, in fulfilling your purpose and mission and refinement of self-character, being a better person. Otherwise, you're not alive. You're not Nasa Adam. You're not a person. Altamin Ba'atzcha, don't take yourself for granted and keep on working on yourself. Each one of us, I'm not just saying it to you, of course, I'm saying it to me and saying it to, we take, we take for granted the, sta the, the state that we're in. You have to always work on self-improvement. Another very important statement, just the beauty of the this, this statements in its own, before we even get the commentary. Do not judge your friend until you are in his place, in his shoes, as the expression goes. You never ever know. Do not judge another person because you do not know what his hardships are, what his challenges are. No two people are alike. You could try to encourage them, you could try to inspire them, you could try to make them better. But do not judge them. You do not know their challenges. There's a, a known story that, uh, Rab, uh, that um, I forgot his name, I'm not good with remembering names. I apologize. He's a uh, uh, Quite, uh, he passed away sadly, but uh, he wrote some great articles on, on, uh, on Chabad.org. And he says the following story of a fellow who walked into a shul in, in Israel, a small little synagogue, and there was a father sitting there with a bunch of uh, young, young kinderlach, young children, and the kids were making a ruckus and they were, and they were noisy. And this guy was like really getting annoyed and he started to shout, Why don't you take care of your kids? And he let him have it. And later someone comes over to him and says, you know, this dad that just came to shul, his wife just passed away. He just lost his wife and mother of all these kids. And you shouted at him. He is, he's broken like a, like a, like a, like a, uh, like a, a Yiddish we say, like a a like a broken shard, a broken vessel. And the fellow felt terrible. He went over to the guy, he apologized profusely. So that's an extreme case. It's not always a situation. But nevertheless, the lesson is there. Do not judge your friend until you reach his, his situation. You don't know. You don't know. Help. Inspire. Lend a helping hand. Don't be judgmental. The vase. Until you get into his place. And in some ways, you'll never be in that person's place. And finally, or actually not finally, he says, Do not say something that cannot be heard, that will at the end be heard. Um, there's a lot of commentary about this. Uh, I'll just share one commentary. Do not say something is not allowed to, it cannot be heard. In other words, don't, since we're talking about educating ourselves and our children, I'll say the commentary that it, it applies this statement of the Mishnah in that context. Sometimes we don't want to rebuke 
or direct our, our children because we're saying they're not going to listen anyway. What's the point? So the Mishnah of Hillel says, who was a great teacher, says, do not say, Al Toimar, do not say, Kama This is something that cannot be heard. There's no point in me saying that. You never know, one day, there's a Vort, there's a Vort, there's a famous Vort. I heard this from Rebetz and Jungreis's daughter. She said, a Vort, she repeated a, 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 a saying from one of the commentaries that it says, These words should be upon your heart. The words you're telling your children should be upon your heart. Why does it say it should be upon your heart? Why does it say it should be in your heart? And the answer is that sometimes there are things that we say that don't enter the heart of our child, of our loved one. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't say it because it's going to stay there upon the heart. But you know, don't know whether one day it's actually going to find its way in the heart. It will. So that's why the Hillel is saying, you go ahead and say, tell your child, tell your student. If it's something that needs to be heard. One day, and we all have examples of that, of things that all of a sudden, from 15 years ago, 20 years ago, an experience, a word, a, a something. Today I was thinking about something, an impact. I saw a person's name, and I realized that his father, who was not my teacher, but I somehow was present at a, at a, at a, at a what we call a farbring, a Hasidic gathering. And at that Hasidic gathering, the fellow sang a Hasidic song with such gusto, with such warmth. And I heard the song today. This is probably more than 30 years ago. And it had like this, this sort of warm, spiritual Hasidic impact on me, remembering how this fellow sang the song. I'll say who it is because it's a good thing. This is Rabbi Bukit, Rabbi Bukit Sr. Some of you might know Rabbi Bukit from Boca. And this was his father, and he sang a song that goes like this. It's a Russian Hasidic song. Uh, I don't even remember exactly what the words mean because it's in, it's in Ukraine, I think. I'm not sure what language. Uh, but the way he sang it, and in the, it, it, with such Hasidic warmth, it had an impact on me. So, Altoimar do not say something is not to be heard because right now it seems like it's not... It's not there. Soy fili ishama. And finally, the final statement, and with that we will conclude. The Mishnah says something that's very apropos to today. Do not say, when I'll have time, I will study. Shema loyti perhaps you will never have the time to do so. That doesn't even have to be elaborated. That's the teachings of Hillel. That's sharing some ethics of the fathers for today. Thank you for joining us. And... Um, Everybody should have a fantastic week. If you have any questions or comments on what we learned today, and I want to uh, please send me those. I'd love to hear that. That's the, the, the greatest uh, pleasure of a teacher. And uh, share these words of Torah. We need words of positivity shared. There's so much, uh, as we say in Yiddish, Narashkeit that's being shared. Share some words of Torah. And uh, that's what I'm here for, to be a conduit of, to share the Torah that I have been taught. And hopefully, uh, as we just learned, it'll go in today into your hearts, or maybe tomorrow, or maybe in a year, maybe in 10 years from now. Share these wonderful words of Torah. Everybody have a fantastic day.